The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Red control, lockdown, emergency break, give me a break. And now, new stay-at-home orders. As the COVID-19 third wave settles in, for some people, the province's messaging has become a blur or worse. Tonight, we'll try to sort out what the province's crisis protocols aim to accomplish and whether they're helping or adding to pandemic fatigue. Also, on this Holocaust Remembrance Day, we'll learn why returning artworks looted by the Nazis during World War II is so fraught with difficulty. It's Wednesday, April 7th, and that's next on The Agenda. Schools are closed in some places, but big box stores are fully open today at least, but don't try to get a haircut or sit on a patio anywhere, unless that's changed in the last few hours as well. The province pulled the so-called emergency break last week due to a third wave in the pandemic and now has issued stay-at-home orders. But is it all too little too late? With us now for more on that, in Burlington, Ontario, Laura Stone, reporter for the Globe and Mail at their Queen's Park Bureau. In Leslieville, in the provincial capital, Amanda Galbraith, principal at Navigator, formerly the Director of Communications to the current Mayor of Toronto, and in Spadina, Fort York, emergency room physician, Dr. Gabri Stephen. And we are delighted to welcome you three. Um, how do we put this? For yet another edition of uh, As the World Turns, lockdown <laughs> edition, or whatever we want to call it here. Let's just acknowledge off the top here, in the interest of full disclosure, we are recording this conversation uh, before... Uh, the government of Ontario has announced its its you know complete details of its latest lockdown orders, but we've basically got the gist of what's going on. Laura, you had a story online uh, first thing this morning, so we've got the gist of it of what's going on. Gabriel, I wonder if I can start with you. Your first time on the program. How has the response been, in your view, to all the restrictions that we have seen put out over the past week, that may be different from previous attempts to lock down? Yeah, well, I I think the biggest thing I need to really emphasize for people is wave three is different. Um, you know, I'm an emergency physician, so I come at this really from what I see uh, at the ground level. I work at Peel, um, so I work in the region that is one of the hardest hit. And I will tell you that the kinds of cases that I'm seeing now in this part of the pandemic, it, I've never seen before. Um, I'm seeing chest x-rays of 30-year-olds that I've never seen in my entire uh, medical training or my medical career so far. And so um, I think one of the big things that we've seen that's different about the way uh, wave three has played out is the call for restrictions stronger and alarm bells are really going off. Um, we're seeing the RNAO, we're seeing the Ontario Medical Association, you know, big groups that don't normally make these uh, statements involving policy coming forward and making statements to say, we got to do more. Um, and we also need to protect essential workers and protect people in the workplace. We know that that's a big driver of the variants of concern, and we know they're growing in workplaces and essential worker neighborhoods. Amanda, let me get you on that. Does anything feel different this time? <laughs> bit of Groundhog Day for a lot of Ontarians, right? And I think the difference is we're not in emergency rooms and we're not seeing what the doctor's talking about seeing, which, you know, is obviously happening and incredibly tragic. So I think people, particularly if you look at the GTA, who have largely been locked down since November, are sort of seeing this hamster wheel continuing on. Cases go up, cases go down, and yet no changes are made, no freedoms are made, and no actual review of the system and the stuff we're asking people to do is say, is this effective, right? Should we be going in and just vaccinating essential workers? Should we be changing our approach rather than locking down hairstylists and mom and pop shops and, and whatever? So I think to me, it feels a lot of more of the same, even if the nature of this pandemic has changed drastically. We have not conditioned the public to understand that and understand why we're pursuing the same stuff that isn't seem to be working. Well, Laura, before I get you to weigh in, let me, just as, as a way of showing in some respects how fast-moving this story is, I want to play a clip of Christine Elliott, the health minister for the province. Uh, this is just, this is less than a week ago on where they were at at that moment. So let's play that clip and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. 
We are not going to be uh, producing a stay-at-home order because we uh, saw that last time that it had a uh, tremendous ill effect on both uh, children and adults. And especially with the warmer weather coming, we want people to be able to go outside and enjoy the outdoors, assuming that everyone continues to follow the public health safety precautions. What we are introducing is an emergency break shutdown that allows uh, some activities to be carried out. But the lockdown we know, with the warmer weather coming, with all that we've asked Ontarians to sacrifice, is too difficult to do. And we also, of course, have to balance any measures that we take with people's uh, mental health as well. That seemed pretty categorical less than a week ago. So what happened? Well, I think that is what's behind so many people's frustrations and why this latest announcement will be deeply unsatisfactory to everyone involved from small business owners, from the conservative base to medical professionals. It's this yo-yo effect of, of consistently uh, mixed messages from this government. Remember, a few weeks ago, we were loosening indoor dining rules and the rules for what a lockdown was. Now we're pull, we've pulled back and are saying a stay at home or home order is necessary and we're closing big box stores um, more than we ever have before. So what happened? It looks like the, the public pressure really got to this government over the course of three to four days uh, and the messages from from the health community are uh, growing stronger and stronger and this government realizes it needs to pivot and pivot quickly in order to address uh, the growing numbers in the ICU units and the, the growing concerns around the variant. But we have these the, this constant up and down push and pull from the government and I think that's what makes this lockdown different is that people are just incredibly tired of being jerked around and uh, they want a decision made and for this to for this to be resolved, we're heading into a more than a year of it. So I think the government is going to face its most difficult audience yet with this latest lockdown. Amanda, you just heard Laura call it a yo-yo effect. What kind of impact does that have on the general public when a yo-yo effect, for lack of a better expression, uh, takes place? I think you see people tune out, right? They see inconsistencies from the government, um, and then they decide they can't trust what the government is going to say. So instead, they turn inward and say, okay, I'm going to make decisions for myself and what I think is best, which may or may not be in keeping with public policy, in keeping with what the doctors are advocating or, or the elected officials. I mean, that is a real danger here, right, is the minute, and I think that the, 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 the communications challenges we've had over the last week with, you know, the premier and the chief medical officer of health for the province saying schools are safe versus regional medical officers of health closing schools. All that tells people is they can't trust anyone anymore. So they just, they ignore it. And I think the minute the public turns off and they do whatever they want, you see these rise of individual businesses staying open. These aren't rebels without a cause. These are yoga instructors. These are gyms. Um, you know, we have the public tuning out of the government's message and what they want them to do. And without that social contract, these lockdowns are not effective. Gabriel, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that there's definitely a yo-yo effect that's happening. Um, I, I mean, I think we need to follow the evidence here. You know, healthcare providers um, have been coming forward um, in addition to medical officers of health. And we've been doing this for months, uh, well before even wave two, uh, talking about workplaces as a serious risk uh, for transmission. And we've been talking about strategies like, for example, paid sick leave. We've been talking about um, bringing vaccinations out to communities that are hardest hit by this virus. And I agree. I really feel for small businesses. We know that 68% of these outbreaks that are happening in workplaces are happening not at ma and pa shops. They're happening at um, large-scale manufacturing plants food processing plants and factories. And so if we're really going to do something different that isn't just the yo-yo effect that we're talking about, we need to address occupational spread. And we need to bring this pandemic down to a point um, where we can open up businesses where they're not having to buy inventory, sell inventory, where they're not having to suddenly shut down or suddenly open. Um, I, I really feel for them. I will get to that angle in a few minutes' time, but Laura, I want to come back on another specific example of something that, again, just a few days ago, by means of example, we heard the Education Minister, Stephen Lecce, and the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford, both say things like, the best and, and most appropriate place for students nowadays is in school, there are mental health issues when they're not going to school, etc. We heard all the arguments. 
And then a whole bunch of medical officers of health came out and said, you know what? There are too many outbreaks in too many schools and we got to pull the pin here. Uh, and suddenly, you know, as of today, school is shut down again. Can you help us understand what powers, not advisory powers, but actual powers, local medical officers of health have in terms of schools open, schools closed, businesses open, businesses closed? Well, I'll try, Steve, after a year of covering this. Um, the, the medical officers have what's what's called a Section 22 power under the, the Health and, and Promotion Act. Uh, I might be messing that title up, but essentially they have legal powers to to order closures from everything we saw, uh, it, it, such as the Amazon uh, facility in Brampton, which was ordered closed a little while ago for a couple of weeks, and of course uh, to schools. And I think you saw at the beginning of the pandemic, there was certainly a lot of resistance from the local uh, medical officers to use this power. And uh, you sort of uh, saw um, a bit of a battle brewing between them and the province of who was a game of chicken, if you will, of who was going to act first. I think now you're seeing uh, them using these powers more widely when, when they're dissatisfied with what the government is doing. And so there, that, that, opens up a debate over who should make the decisions. What, is it elected officials? Is it the, the medical experts? Um, and it does, it, and, it, and there's a lot of criticism uh, that the government is sort of abdicating responsibility here at the local level. On the flip side, there is uh, also a concern that these medical officers are overstepping in some way. So uh, these powers do exist. They exist in law, but I think uh, certainly we're seeing them being used more and more and for much more serious uh, things such as closing schools, which is a, a very drastic step and impacts uh, hundreds of thousands of families. Well, okay, Amanda, let's acknowledge this is complicated because on the one hand, nobody voted for these medical officers of health and yet they have this apparently very important power to make certain decisions. Um, normally we imbue politicians with those decisions, but on the other hand, they sure as heck are not public health experts and have to rely on these MOHs to get, you know, the right information to do their jobs. So where, where does your comfort level lie in the balance between who ought to be making these calls? You know, and then the hard thing about this watching is it's, it's happening in real time, right? And for me, I'll be totally frank, I am uncomfortable with the Section 22 authorities being used the way they are right now. I think that the public, med the medical officers of health should be loudly and publicly advocating for what they feel is best, um, which they've been doing via open letters, which gets lots of action, right? The open letter about we need a province-wide shutdown, guess what, four days later, it's happening. Um, but the idea that individual medical officers can make broad statements, close schools down, against the will of elected officials at multiple levels of government to me uh, is deeply troubling. And I think the, the issue is we can't hold who are we holding accountable for that, right? And we see these public scuffles that further contribute to people being desensitized, being disengaged, and being frustrated with how this is being managed. And I mean, this is the system we have set up. Um, and I really, truly hope that in the other end of this, we take a good, hard look at having medical officers across the province having individual powers to do whatever it is that they wish if they don't agree with the politician. Politicians basically saying, you know what, I don't want to make the tough call. I'm going to let them do it and take the heat, which is also unacceptable. I, I just, uh, to me, I think it's deeply troubling. Section 22 is meant to shut down like a business if they're being, you know, there's rats in the place. It's not meant to broadly close schools. Um, so I think we have to have a real discussion as society is who do we want to make these decisions? For me, it's the elected officials who can be held accountable by the voters. I am curious to hear what the ER doc thinks about who ought to be making these calls. Gabriel, what do you say? So, I mean, in an absolute ideal setting, um, elected officials should meet the moment and come out and support the evidence that's being brought to them. But the unfortunate reality is over the course of this pandemic, we have seen this not happen time and time again. It was not that long ago that um, medical officers of health across Ontario came forward in support of something they paid sick leave. And then we saw Amazon outbreaks in their factories and we saw Section 22 invoked. And again, the call was for paid sick leave. And now we're seeing this happen again. I just want to point out the fact that there are several government uh, representatives and agencies that enact authorities all the time. Uh, police officers do this by enforcing the law. This just happens to be within the jurisdiction of public health physicians um, who are not acting out as 
you know, doctors or physicians um, acting with their uh, uh, unreasonable powers, but are doing this truly uh, for the health of their local community, which is their jurisdiction. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, again, I come at this again as someone who works in Peel. Um, I see what's happening in Peel, and it, I can truly say that it's on fire right now in terms of what we're seeing. Um, and so these aren't taken lightly. They've been monitoring um, schools for a very long time. Um, and the reality is these are powers that exist, um, not because they were just granted out of the whim uh, for medical officers of health. Uh, these were powers that were uh, given to them um, through the authorities of elected officials through history. Um, so I just want to make that clear. Okay, well, fair enough. Let me do a quick follow-up with you, though, Gabri, which is, you know, again, for, for a good week, we have been hearing the education minister and the premier both saying, yes, there are more outbreaks in schools now, but 99% of our schools are safe, and therefore the best place for the kids is in the schools. And then, of course, just earlier this week, bang, zoom. They're all shut down, and we're back to virtual learning for the next, whatever it is, two or three weeks. Was it the right call to shut down the schools? You know, I, it's difficult for me to answer because I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist. But again, I can tell you from the ground level as a frontline worker, um, what I'm seeing is that we're in an emergency. Um, I'm, I'm seeing numbers and cases that I haven't seen before in wave one when we did shut down schools. Um, certainly, schools should be the last to be shut down and should be the first to open. I completely recognize the importance uh, of, of in-person education, um, but I can't understate uh, the kind of emergency and crisis that we're in right now. All right, Laura, as promised, let's get to the uh, business angle here. We know that one of the biggest controversies over the past year has been the fact that the Walmarts of the world and the Costcos of the world have been allowed to stay open and enrich their shareholders and make record profits while small business people have been ordered shut down and are losing their shirts like, like never before. What's going to change as we understand the shutdown rules uh, coming into effect soon as to what Costco's and the Walmarts are going to be allowed to do versus what they're not going to be allowed to do? Well, it's a huge U-turn on the part of the government uh, because there have been calls to do this from small business since uh, the start of all the lockdowns. But essentially, uh, the government, uh, from what we understand, is going to limit which goods can be sold in these big box stores uh, to just groceries and pharmacy items, not all of the other uh, other items that we see at Costco, for instance, books, clothes, toys, uh, all of the extras uh, that other retailers would not be able to sell in person. Uh, the government throughout this has consistently said that they this would be too logistically difficult. I think the premier called it a logistical nightmare and they resisted it up until now. But clearly uh, they see some vulnerability here with the business community to put it lightly uh, with this latest shutdown or lockdown or whatever you want to call it. Um, and so they've, they've they're going to take this additional step uh, in order to try to appease the small business community. But I simply don't think that's going to happen. I think uh, the story of this pandemic and um, and the greatest risk for the government in terms of, of the business side of things is the anger uh, and disillusion from small business owners over what this government has done. And not just retail, but restaurants. Amanda's talked about hairstylists. Remember that the government uh, allowed patios to open in Toronto and Peel after months of closures, only to close them down just a few weeks later. They dangled the possibility to uh, hair salons and other personal services that they would be allowed to open in April. People were booking appointments. Now they've turned around and shut everything down again preemptively before they even had a chance to open in some of these regions. So uh, I, I go back to this yo-yo effect, but this kind of this manic pace and messaging from the government, um, I think, has really disillusioned a lot of people who you would have considered their core supporters uh, a year ago. Hmm. Amanda, let me set up this next question to you by showing you something from Ikea. This was the scene outside one big box store. This is this past Saturday captured by somebody named Victor on Twitter who wrote, this is a video of Ikea North York this morning, but my wife can't open her salon on appointment after investing thousands on PPE, hashtag Ford failed Ontario. And then do we want to do the next one? Sheldon, why don't we flip the next one over as well? This is Yorkdale Mall now. Uh, where are we? Similarly, yeah. Well, again, large crowds seen over the weekend inside Yorkdale, 
Um, and then a Toronto beauty shop owner who posted this video said she found this completely unfair. Her business has been closed for more than 300 days this past year. You know, Amanda, I've, I'm seeing comments in the paper that go to the effect of every time I open and close my business and then have to reopen and close, it cost me 10,000 bucks. And the province promised 10 to $20,000 stipends for small business to help out which essentially that entire budget measure is gone in one reopening, closing and reopening. I guess I just sort of throw all that you and say, WTF. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we're all a bit WTF about this. And I think understandably Ontario businesses and the CFIB has been incredibly vocal on this are tremendously frustrated. And, you know, the government's doing the best that they can, but the idea that you know, I can go to Yorkdale or Ikea and line up like that, but it's unsafe for me to go get my hair cut with PP. It just makes, I think, zero sense to the public, which is why, again, we see them tuning out. And, you know, I would also just like to emphasize that these personal care industries have been so badly hurt and targeted in this, so much more so than almost anything else other than restaurants. They're 81% female owned. Um, they are broadly being ignored in the public, and, and they've been able to safely up their trace people like everyone else. So I think. I don't understand but today's shutdown seems to be a bit more fair to everyone as far as everybody being shut down. But to me, the question is, is that the right play? I think we're talking about the fact that we know, as mentioned, 60 percent of these infections are happening in the Amazons and the major distribution centers. So, like, let's actually look at this surgically as opposed to just taking a giant hammer to everything and then allowing folks to go to the mall. I mean, it makes no sense, which sounds like the government's recalibrating today. But I think people are still genuinely frustrated and businesses are rightfully angry and losing their shirts. And there's been no support from the government to accommodate them. Gabriel, we heard the mention of Amazon there. And we know that Amazon, I guess, recently found more than 900 cases um, among workers in one GTA um, factory uh, since the uh, pandemic began. What, why is that happening in such huge numbers there? Totally. Um, I, you know, I think when we shut down businesses, we're kind of treating the end result of what is a whole series of issues that are leading to these vulnerabilities. Uh, we really need to look into workplaces and what are the vulnerabilities in the workplace that are leading to these outbreaks. Um, so one of them being a lack of uh, PPE. But um, another big thing is these are precarious workers in uh, racialized communities that are coming to these factories with out a lot of employment standards, right? Um, they don't have uh, the same level of paid sick leave. Uh, they don't have the same uh, social capital to speak out um, out of fear of uh, losing their job. And so it's sad. I really feel for small businesses. Um, Better Way Alliance is a group here in Ontario that is a group of over 60 small businesses um, and mid-sized business owners that have come forward talking about the importance of decent work um, because they realize that small businesses are not the ones that are, you know, not giving paid sick leave for the most part. Well, you know, it's places like Amazon where something like paid sick leave would be a drop in the bucket for them. Um, but they're the ones that are driving up cases and therefore we're seeing this impact on small businesses. So, you know, decent work and improving decent work conditions uh, in all companies and all establishments where people work is one way we can really help small businesses and help by helping this pandemic, right? Laura, I want to talk to you a bit about the politics of all of this. And uh, I note that the three most recently published polls by Abacus, Campaign Research and Leger all have the governing progressive conservative party, not only in first place, but a reasonably comfortable first place a year and change before the next election. And I guess if people were really, really unhappy at the way things are going, you would have expected to see one of the other two or three opposition parties doing much better in the polls. And I guess my question for you is, how come they're not? Well, I think there's a few factors. One is uh, this pandemic has benefited incumbents. I mean, people are looking to their governments uh, like never before, their leadership. Um, and whether they disagree with them or they're they're upset or angry, I think that there's a, kind of a, a faith placed in in governments right now in the way that we don't usually see and we've seen in in elections that have been held during during the pandemic that that it has benefited the parties in power. Um, I also think it's it's difficult for the opposition to break through. Uh, yes, they're out there uh, and they have they're, they're criticizing the government and and they're. They're trying to get airtime, but 
what people are most paying attention to do is what is what the government is actually doing. And so I just think the um, you know the balance is really shifted towards the parties in power. I think we have seen the the premier's personal uh, approval ratings fall. And while there was a bump at the beginning, um, he hasn't been doing as well with the public in in recent months. But these things, you know, it's a it's a year out, a year more than a year out from from the election. I think people maybe aren't pay, uh, paying as much attention to the polling as they normally would. But I just generally believe that it's it's because the governments in power are the ones that are taking up all the airtime, and people are paying most attention to them. Amanda, can I get your theory on this? Yeah, I think Laura's bang on is that people crave security in times of crisis. You know, we don't know if our kids are going to school tomorrow. We don't know if we're going to have a paycheck in a week. So I think people are broadly saying, you know, we're going to bet the government that's in charge right now. So I bet you if Prime Minister goes to an election, which seems likely in the offing, he'll get reelected. I think the premier would be the same. Um, I also think there's a general feeling of sort of a pox on all their houses and that everybody screwed this up. It's not one individual versus the other. And there's been limited opportunity for the opposition to cut through. So cut through. So I think that I think broadly the public understands this is complicated. Yes, they are tremendously frustrated that it has not translated yet to a dramatic hit in the polls. Where the opportunity to frankly have that debate is going to be post, right? After this happens. Um, so I would suspect that most parties will try and take advantage of the vaccine to, you know, almost recover timeline um, and, and see if they can run so they can get reelected. Hmm. Uh, we've got just a few minutes left here, and I want to show the three of you a picture, the likes of which we have not seen, certainly in Canada, in more than a year. Uh, everybody knows this picture now, right? This is in Arlington, Texas, at the ballpark, the home ballpark of the Texas Rangers of Major League Baseball, where the Blue Jays played on opening day for Texas, and they have a full stadium. They got 40,000 plus people there. And we have been accustomed to watching sporting events with either a few thousand or no people in the seats at all over the past year. And, you know, Gaby, they've made their decision in Texas. We're going to open it up. They asked people to wear masks. Not everybody did, but the place was packed. Does what you see in Texas give you any pause that we're on the wrong track here? Well, Texas is different than Toronto, right? And different than Ontario. I mean, um, the reality is uh, there's differences there in terms of how people have been vaccinated. Uh, we know that uh, per capita, uh, Ontario is not distributing vaccines uh, at the same rate uh, that places in the United States, including Texas, has been. Um, now, it does give me pause in the sense that we'll have to see how this plays out, right? Um, the reality is we won't know the impact of these kinds of events until weeks after. Um, and we'll have to see how this actually plays out as far as Texas is concerned. Well, that's my point, Laura. If, if you know, 10 days or 15 days from now, we discover that the state of Texas's positivity rate for COVID-19 is still flat... There's going to be a lot of people asking a lot of questions about why they can't go to a ball game outdoors, right? Well, I think Canadians are very reasonable in their views on this. I don't think that there's a lot of desire to go to an event with thousands of people right now, but I think people want to have some of their friends and family over for a backyard barbecue. So, uh, you know, that's one extreme. And of, of course, vaccinations play into it. And uh, we're just not there in the, in the rate of immunity uh, within our community. Uh, I don't think people are looking to Texas and saying, I wish that was us. I'm sure there is a contingent in this country that, that is or in this province, but I think it's more so people want uh, reasonable options from their government and they want them to be targeting the right things so that this this the worst of this pandemic can be over. So I think it's something in the middle. They they don't necessarily need to go to a ball game with 40,000 people, but maybe they'd like to to have a dinner at a restaurant in the next uh, couple of months. So I think I think there's a balance here and I think uh, you know, we're, we're so far from that. I don't know if that anyone can even imagine doing an activity like that again at this moment. Well, I, I can certainly imagine it. I, I just can't really see it happening for a long time, but I know what you mean. Um, and we'll all be keeping our eyes out, of course, for a new vaccine strategy coming up really soon because uh, Texas can do what Texas did, I guess, because they've vaccinated probably three times as many people as we have up here. Anyways, Laura Stone, Amanda Galbraith, Gabriel Steven, it's really good of all of you to join us on TVO tonight and help us with uh, lockdown episode three and counting. Take care, everybody. Thank you.
think. In the years leading up to and then during World War II, millions of paintings and other cultural artifacts were stolen from their rightful owners by the Nazi Third Reich. Most often, that meant from Jewish families and private collections, as well as from museums and other institutions. Getting those objects returned to their owners has been an incredibly complex undertaking. Canada, for instance, has no specific law covering Holocaust-era restitution. With us to take a closer look, we welcome, in Boston, Massachusetts, Nicholas O'Donnell, a partner at the law firm Sullivan & Worcester, and author of A Tragic Fate, Law and Ethics in the Battle Over Nazi Looted Art. In Hamilton, Ontario, Christine Braun, collection manager at the Art Gallery of Hamilton. And in the Dover Court neighborhood of Ontario's capital city, there's Sarah Angel, Nazi-era restitution scholar and founder of Art Canada Institute. And it's great to have you three on TVO tonight. Uh, this is a subject I suspect is going to come as news to a lot of people. So let's get some background in place before we dive in. Sarah, to you first. I gather, I gather there's sort of three categories of art that the Nazis were interested in seizing eight plus decades ago. Maybe we can start there. What are those three categories? Sure, Steve. Thanks for that question. Um, when the Nazis came to power in 1933, there was a cultural policy that they put into place um, where they were very concerned about art, very interested in it, and where they began seizing art for themselves. To talk about the three categories that you mentioned, there was a group of art, of, of paintings, that the Nazis wanted for themselves. These were works that were they considered part of the ideal of their Aryan aesthetics, works by Rembrandt, works by Vermeer. And these were works that they seized from private collectors as well as museums. Then there was a work, a group of works uh, that Nazis declared as degenerate works of art. These were works that were more contemporary, more modern works, such as expressionist works of art, works as impressionist works of art, um, works that they saw not fitting into the Aryan ideal. And what they did with these works is rather than seize them for their own collections, what they did was they knew they had value uh, in other parts of the world, largely in North America. So they figured out a way through a sophisticated group of, of dealers that were working for them to be able to sell off these works internationally. And that is how so many works of Nazi looted art ended up in North America. And finally, Steve, there was a third group that of, of art that uh, fell into the prey of the Nazis during the uh, Nazi era regime. And those were works that were owned by Jewish collectors that the Nazis didn't particularly value to sell off abroad, um, but which the Nazis said that Jews could not own because they were Jewish, works that belonged uh, to gallery, Jewish gallery owners, for example, uh, or works that people had in their own private collections. And these were works, a lot of works, I would say the vast majority, that were lost by people who were sort of in the middle class and who had to either forcibly sell their works of art or these works um, may have been uh, used as a way for somebody to um, be able to pay for food, uh, be able to uh, fend for themselves in a circumstance of loss because of persecution because they were anti-Semitic. Okay, with that background now in place, Nicholas, I'm going to bring you in because we want to move to the year 1998. All of this has happened in the past, but in 1998, we get something called the Washington Principles. What are they? The Washington Principles came out of a conference organized by the U.S. State Department uh, called the, the Washington Conference on Nazi-era assets, Holocaust-era assets. And late in the conference, as the, com as the delegates had been discussing things like gold and deposit accounts in Europe and insurance policies, it came up that the Nazis had, of course, looted so much art and perhaps this ought to be addressed. What came out of it were what we now call the Washington Principles, which were a series of aspirational goals about how to deal with claims for which there might not be an obvious legal remedy, for which their limitations period may have, been, uh, have expired, for which proof may not uh, have, have met the normal standard, and to urge the 44 countries that participated in the Washington Conference to come up with what they called fair and just solutions. Um, that took a number of forms, and it still 
as I'm sure we'll discuss somewhat in the eye of the beholder, but it started a process of countries in Europe in particular trying to, to create avenues by which art in their national collections could be restituted. And a quick follow-up, Nicholas, uh, are these principles binding, and if so, on whom? They are not binding. They are not an international treaty ratified in the normal course. And so they are still very much, as I said, to call it aspirational, kind of a, a moral signpost, if you will, to urge participating countries to reach beyond strict legal definitions in confronting this difficult topic. And how many countries have signed on? So there were 44 countries at the Washington conference. Uh, I forget the exact number at the Terezin follow-up conference in 2009, but it was similar, give or take a couple. Okay, so we're at 44 anyway, and, and uh, presumably maybe a dozen or so NGOs beyond that. Yes. That sounds right. Okay, good. All right, Christine, now we bring you in here. The notion, the notion that there may be Nazi looted paintings hanging on the walls of even the art gallery of Hamilton, who knows? Was that something in the 1990s or 20 years ago that, uh, that anybody would have considered within the realm of possibility? Uh, not us, certainly. Um, I can speak as a, you know, a medium-sized institution with a predominantly Canadian collection. Um, to put it in perspective, in 1998, we had 7,000 works. 5,000 of those were Canadian. So, of course, we were aware of the creation of the Washington Principles, um, and we did have smaller uh, pockets in the collection featuring American, British, Dutch, French, German art, but those had been historically collected uh, for the way that they informed Canadian art. So we really had a Canadian focus. So it really wasn't on our radar to be 100% honest, and I can imagine that was the case with a lot of similar institutions. All right, Sarah, do we have a rough ballpark figure as to how much the Nazi looted art may in fact be in Canada today? We do, and, and here's a way to look at it. In 1998, after the Washington Principles, it became, the Washington Principles took place because 50 years after the Second World War, uh, cl files, cl classified files were declassified, made accessible, and all of a sudden, people started realizing um, works that had been lost in, in by the Nazis could be reclaimed. So they had access to information. Second of all, claims started being made in the United States between 1995 and 1998 for Nazi looted works of art in museums. So the Washington Principles comes into place to say, wait a minute, people are making claims. There are works of Nazi looted art that are in North American museums. And the figure, Steve, that you're talking about is, is when the Nazis were in power, about 25% of works of art in Europe were in play, somehow touched by Nazi hands, either plundered, either confiscated. Um, and it is estimated that today, there are over 100,000 works of art, of Nazi looted art, that still haven't been returned to their owner. So the, the issue is very much out there. You're showing a, an image of the Monuments Men, who many will know from the George Clooney film, after the Second World War, the Allied forces tried to return as much art as they could to those who had lost it. But the situation that took place is that so many individuals who had lost art had either perished during the Holocaust, and today we're on the show because it is Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. So those people had perished or records had been lost. And what ended up happening is the Monuments Men returned works of art to different countries where the art had been seized from. And those countries, uh, for a period, tried to return the works of art, but as, as I said, many people had perished and were unable to claim them. And then what they did was they gave them to museums to be able to put those works into museum collections and on museum walls. And that is how we get to the situation in the place we are now. Hmm. Nicholas, if there are 100,000 pieces out there that come under the category of what we're discussing here tonight, uh, you know, I have to infer that there are lots of countries that are really good guys about returning art to where it belongs, and there are some who are not so good about doing this. Can you make us a bit of a checklist here? So I think it's fair to say that there are, there are many countries that, particularly since the Washington Principles, have tried um, to varying degrees to engage with this topic, to figure out, as Sarah said, what to do with 
large numbers of works that ended up in the possession of the national government because either the willpower trailed off in the 1950s or the trail went cold and the claims process in the 40s and 50s didn't lead to a restitution. The Washington Conference led to the Netherlands, Germany, Austria, the United Kingdom, and France to create more formal procedures to deal with claims in the present day. Um, but a lot of countries have not tried at all. Uh, there are a lot of countries that participated in the Washington Conference, let alone after the war, that have really made no effort at all and, and that are very hostile to the topic entirely. Come on, Nicholas, name names. Well, I think Hungary is the most egregious offender. I think Poland, under the current government, has become increasingly hostile and has turned claimants into uh, a way to sort of spin the narrative and accuse claimants of besmirching Poland, while at the same time seeking aggressively uh, and, and justifiably works that were taken from Polish museums and ended up elsewhere as a result of either the German or the Soviet army. Sarah, what's your view on how well or not Canada is participating in all of this. Steve, I think Canada is uh, at a record all-time low in their participation of this and um, or in their participation of uh, properly restituting Nazi looted art. Now, I should say that there have only been four cases in Canada that have taken place. Um, one at the National Gallery of Canada, where actually its practice was exemplary, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the Hamilton Museum of Arts that Christine has talked about. And then at the Art Gallery of Ontario, there was a case uh, where a painting was restituted in very late 2020, um, the news of which was broken in around January. And what came out was that the Art Gallery of Ontario restituted a painting to a claimant in England, but no process was followed, uh, no public process. Nicholas mentioned England, um, France, the Netherlands, the European, five European countries who have a very accurate public process, a very transparent one where before any work is restituted, um, a, a serious investigation is made that often takes a number of years. Um, and then a recommendation is usually made to a cultural minister uh, who then decides whether the work should be restituted or not. So in other words, there is a really, really deep dive into what the provenance of a work of art is before it's given back. And the reason, Steve, that that is so necessary is because um, in my view and in the view of many, the importance of restitution is about the art, but it is about also the art representing the lives of those who suffered, uh, who perished and who were persecuted during the Nazi era, during the Holocaust. And so, Provenance research and an accurate restitution is so important because ultimately it is an honor of the memory of those who uh, were persecuted in the past and it is a correcting of what went wrong. Understood. Christine, I'm sure everybody listening carefully would have heard Sarah mention your institution in that last answer as a place involved in all of this. And so I want to ask you about something that happened in 2003 when I gather a letter written in German, came to the Art Gallery of Hamilton, saying what? Uh, saying that there was a claim uh, that a work in our collection, Portrait of a Lady by Johannes Cornelius Frischbronck, um, there was a claim being made. The family of a woman named Alma Salmonson was claiming that the work was, um, did in fact belong to them. Um, so we were shocked, surprised, mixed with disbelief. Um, as you say, it landed on the doorstep. It was in German. It took us a while to digest what was inside uh, the letter. It was complete with, you know, a lot of archival documents substantiating uh, the life of the painting and Alma's trials. Um, and, you know, all we knew about the work was that we had purchased it in 1987 at a very public venue, um, an auction of Sotheby's in New York City of important old master paintings. So there was that sense that this couldn't be the same painting. We, you know, we understood Verspronck as an artist did repeat um, subject matter. He would paint variations on the same sitter. So once we sort of realized what was happening, we, we decided to take a good look at that possibility. Um, what happened then was a, a real education for all of us. 
Well, okay, let's let's keep we going with the about, story here. Um, yeah, you you presumably have to undertake an investigation okay. to <laughs> to uh, understand the provenance or the origin of the painting. And how long did that take? And what did you find? It took us a long time. You know, um, going through the initial documents. You know, we knew we had purchased our painting in '87. Um, but here we learned a tale of Alma Salmonson, Alma and Albert, a wealthy Jewish family living in Germany, um, uh, people of means, having properties. They had a fine art collection of 25 works. Albert died in the early 30s. In 1939, Alma made it known her wish to flee to England with her three children. Um, and of course, her goods were confiscated. She was allowed to keep just a small amount of those. Um, you know, her entire belongings were sold and she did not see any, any compensation for that. Um, she sent her kids ahead to England and then she packed her remaining belongings in three containers. Um, and she lists in her inventory out of her artworks, she had eight paintings and two sculpture. Um, and one of the paintings is listed as Portrait of a Lady by Johannes Verstrunk. So Alma fled to England, obviously, fearing for her well-being, but her belongings never made it there. Hmm. So where's the painting today, and what ultimately did you guys decide to do? Oh, um, well, it was a long road. Uh, it took us about 12 years. Hmm. Um, the reasons for that, uh, you know, are kind of mundane in a way. Um, you know, as I mentioned, of correspondence would come to us in German. We would translate, we would seek counsel. We would write back requesting certain information from the, the claimants. Um, you know, at no time was there any barrier on either side except for geography uh, and time and language. Um, there was a period of six years where we did not hear anything and we thought perhaps that um, the claim uh, was um, sort of was not going forward. But then we received a renewal in 2011 stating, you know, apologizing, stating that the lead council had, had um, passed away. Uh, and then things just started moving again. Um, we, in the provenance, our curator of European art at the time, Patrick Shaw Cable, um, while we could not get any information from Sotheby's about the seller, Patrick was able to use his um, connections. He had worked at the Cleveland Museum of Art previously. And he found that the work had actually um, been in the possession of Johnny Van Heften, who was a dealer in London, contacted Mr. Van Heften, who said, yes, I'm the one who put it to Sotheby's for sale. And I acquired it two years ago from a runner, which was a term I learned during this whole thing. I learned many things, um, a runner, and he only had a last name for that person. So at that point, you know, we realized even though there was still a gap in the provenance research, it was too compelling to ignore that this was in fact the same portrait that belonged to Alma and her family. And where's the portrait now? Oh, my apologies. Uh, it's in, well, the family is based in uh, Philadelphia, but I believe now she was going to a home in New Mexico, um, a holiday home. That's where they took her. Gotcha. Uh, Nicholas, this is, of course, just one example of myriad examples of what happens when a painting becomes at the center of an investigation. And I guess I want to find out from you, on whom do you think the onus is to figure all this out? The victims and their descendants to investigate or museums and galleries to investigate and ultimately, quote unquote, do the right thing? Well, I think as a practical matter, the onus remains on the families, and I think that's one of the big challenges. The fact is, because of the way works were dispersed both back to countries in Europe as well as into the private market with destinations unknown over the course of the intervening decades, families often don't know where to start. Families often don't even necessarily know what they lost or that they lost anything. And so it is quite often that things are sort of sitting in plain sight that if someone could connect the dots, the conversation could begin. This is not a complicated, uh, th this is a complicated question to answer because then the question becomes where do the resources come from to, to forward that conversation? But I think there is good news and there is bad news both. American museum associations have urged their institutions to undertake research proactively. I was 
an employee of a museum in the late 1990s that did that. That's one of the ways I got into this work. And a lot of museums, I think, deserve a lot of credit for doing that. And the challenge continues to, to find those resources and find that energy. Now, in terms of the work that you do, would you look at this story from the Art Gallery of Hamilton and say, this was a story that ultimately had a happy ending? I think, I th you know, it's hard for me to, to, to judge the circumstances of others, but it seems like the claimants and the family found peace with the outcome. Um, I'm sure it was a difficult decision for the museum, which I credit it for, you know, engaging with in good faith and, and, and working hard at it. So I would say yes. Okay, Sarah, let me get you back in here. And in doing so, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up a picture here of what was a Nazi looted painting called Still Life with Flowers by Jan von Kessel. This, is, this goes back to 1660. And this also, this painting, got into the middle of a huge controversy about its provenance and where it ought to be. And, um, well, you know all about this. Why don't you tell us the story behind this one? I, I do, Steve, and I know about it because I wrote an editorial about it for the Globe and Mail. And um, the reason I did was because as somebody who teaches on art restitution and Nazi looted art, um, I was fascinated by this case because what happened was that the Art Gallery of Ontario restituted the painting to a claimant in England. And right after they returned the painting to England, it left Canada, uh, the Art Gallery of Ontario put up on their website a provenance history for the painting. And in that provenance history, it included the name Gallery Stern, 1937. So uh, Nicholas had mentioned that often claimants don't know that they are looking for a work of art. And that was the case with this instance. There is an organization, a 20 year organization that's based in Montreal called the Max Stern Restitution Project. And that project uh, was named after a very famous Canadian art dealer. He was an art dealer for Emily Carr, and his name was Max Stern. And, in, and he, in 1937, lost over uh, 300 works of art from his Dusseldorf gallery. He was forced by the Nazis to sell him and sell the works. Actually, Nicholas wrote a great book, and he devotes a chapter to Max Stern, which gives you an indication of how well Max Stern is known internationally uh, and how revered the Max Stern Restitution Project is. In any case, uh, the Art Gallery of Ontario puts onto its website that the painting had been part of the Stern Gallery in Dusseldorf in 1937. So although the Max Stern Restitution Project never knew that this was a painting that it was looking for, when it saw that piece of information on the AGO website, it contacted the AGO and said, what can you tell us about this painting? Would you be? Would you help us? We want to learn more. Um, the claimant who came forth that you returned the painting to, what information did they provide in order to give you solid evidence that it was theirs? And then what the AGO did was something that was really surprising, which is that they just took off that piece of information from their website. They essentially just expunged that piece of information from history without any explanation, which Steve, unfortunately, is a major museum, um, uh, you know, no, no, you would just never do something like that. Well, you said they botched it. You used the word botched. Um, they they botched it. I mean, it, it just, it, it one thing with provenance information is you have to have complete transparency about what is going on. Um, and the AGO has continued to not offer any kind of transparency. Um, your producer told me, Steve, that the AGO's representatives were invited to be on this program. And I believe if they were really committed to this issue, they would be here in a discussion with us tonight. Hmm. We should say, just for the record, incidentally, that the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario did tell us that this is a complex and evolving situation. They say they've got a new internal committee that is reviewing their provenance policies, and I guess we should stay tuned. Okay, N Nicholas, let me give you the last word on this because I can imagine there's some people watching this saying there are lots of problems in the world and uh, we're trying to right the wrongs of something that happened seven, eight, nine decades ago. And what's wrong with just sort of letting sleeping dogs lie and who gives a damn about any of this anyway? The response to those folks who think that way, Nicholas, is what? The response is that everybody who was victimized by this horrible historic crime 
responded to it in different ways. And I would say, in my experience, the most common way that people responded to it, particularly right after the war, was to move on with their lives as best they could and often didn't have the means or the knowledge or the or the access to to push these things. But the fact is, these were people's belongings. And, and when people ask me that question about why is this worth the effort, I, I remind them that most of these works are not market-setting, multi-million-dollar paintings. Most of these works were objects of beauty that people had in their homes because they liked them. And I, I respond to that by saying, imagine the things that, that bring you happiness, and imagine if the worst people you know were allowed to come into your home and just take them from you. And, and, and would you just let that go? I, I don't think I would. That's a good answer. And with that, Nicholas, Christine, and Sarah, I want to thank you very much for coming onto the agenda tonight and uh, giving us some real insight into uh, a most unusual and complicated situation. Thanks so much to you all. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, April 7th, 2021. Housing prices have gone sky high across the province since the pandemic began. Tomorrow, we'll assess what policy tools could help and consider whether reform in the real estate industry is needed. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. The agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.